Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Angel, the Communications and Program Coordinator at the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. ERI is proud to present this rebroadcast of the 2021 ERI Distinguished Lecture, Operationalizing Lifeline Infrastructure System Resilience to Earthquakes. This is the first in a series of webinars this fall with Dr. Craig Davis that will be hosted by different ERI regional chapters. Next week's event, Seismic Resilience Lifeline Networks, will be hosted by the Southern California chapter and will bring together Dr. Davis with a panel of experts from local infrastructure systems in the region. I hope you will join us for this and future webinars in the series, which will be announced later this fall. For those who may not be familiar with us, I want to say a few words about ERI before starting the rebroadcast. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting those dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. ERI has been bringing together people and disciplines since 1948. By joining EERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. With that, I'll turn it over to the recording where Dr. Katarina Ziotopoulou of the University of California at Davis will introduce Dr. Davis and host the lecture. Now, I am very, very pleased to introduce our speaker, ERI's 2021 Distinguished Lecturer, Craig Davis. Craig is a professional consultant on geotechnical, earthquake, and lifeline infrastructure system resilience engineering. In his three decade long career at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Craig worked as a departmental chief resilience officer, seismic manager, and geotechnical engineering manager. From this position, he developed a comprehensive LA water system resilience program, he has published more than 150 technical papers and he has investigated numerous earthquakes. He has served on professional committees, including the Building Seismic Safety Council, the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program Advisory Committee on Earthquake Hazards Reduction, and the AESCE Infrastructure Resilience Division. Craig Davis has been honored with the AECE 2016 Laval Lund Award for Practicing Lifeline Risk Reduction and the 2020 Charles Martin Duke Lifeline Earthquake Engineering Award. He has received a bachelor's from the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo and his master's and PhD from the, Cal from the University of Southern California, all in civil and engineering. Personally, I have worked with Craig over the last two or three years, and he has been an incredible mentor and collaborator to work with. The ERI Distinguished Lecture Award recognizes ERI members who have made outstanding contributions to earthquake risk reduction. This lecture is designed to encourage communications and dialogue on important and timely topics. Congratulations, Craig, on this incredible honor, and I really look forward to your lecture. Without further ado, Welcome to Craig Davis. Thank you, Katarina. Uh, I want to start by um, thanking the ERI and all of the membership for this great honor of receiving this award. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very honored and uh, I want to thank all of ERI and the membership. It's a terrific organization for which I'm tremendously proud to be a part of. So today I'm going to give a lecture titled Operationalizing Lifeline Infrastructure System Resilience to Earthquakes. What I'm going to present to you today is first an overview of lifeline infrastructure systems and their services. Then we'll move on to infrastructure resilience, functionality, operability, basic service categories, and functional recovery. And then I'll conclude with some examples of operationalizing uh, resilience from some experiences that I have and then conclude with some final steps, some next steps. Infrastructure systems uh, are defined as the physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of society and enterprise. Uh, lifeline infrastructure systems are a subset of this total definition of infrastructure systems and they include water, wastewater, stormwater, electric power, communication, gas and liquid fuels, transportation, and solid waste systems. Uh, we need to think of them as social technical systems because lifeline systems include the physical infrastructure and organizations that manage them. Uh, lifeline systems are large geographically distributed systems. Some cover multiple regions, states, and even countries. Others are limited to the city scale. Uh, they're made of numerous interlinked specialized components designed and built over long timeframes used in a variety of standard procedures and materials. They are independent and usually co-located. 
that means that the performance of one can affect the others. The proximity means that failure of one can result in unintended damage to others. Uh, these lifeline systems need to intimately coordinate, but yet they tend to operate in silos. Failures in a single system can result in cascading failures in other systems. Uh, this can result in public health and safety concerns, uh, including flooding, explosion, fire, electrocution, contaminated water, blocking mobility and communication systems, uh, and a wide loss of services, among other things. This image, this photograph on the right side of the screen is a picture of Babo Boulevard following the 1994 Northridge earthquake, where uh, some permanent ground movements damaged a, a wide number of lifeline systems. And as you can see in the image, many of these public health and safety concerns uh, previously identified are, are exposed right here in this one uh, event. We need to think of uh, lifeline systems as part of the systems of systems within the broader technical and social systems, as well as how they provide services for others to provide services. Lifeline systems are made up of many subsystems or several subsystems. All of those subsystems must coordinate and provide services to end users. Each subsystem provides services used by other subsystems. So it's, it's a, a chain of events to get these services to customers. Uh, these subsystems may be owned and operated by different entities, which requires uh, more intricate and delicate coordination. And those entities may be public and private. Here at the bottom of the screen, I show uh, water subsystems, which include supply, treatment, transmission, and distribution. The distribution system is what provides uh, the services to the customers and users. Here's an example of electric power subsystems, just to give a different idea. Here, the electric power is made up of supply, transmission, and distribution subsystems and the distribution provides the services to the users and customers. These systems provide services to customers, which we need to understand include other lifeline infrastructure systems, which I'll explain here in a few minutes. So lifeline system service combinations are used to provide other societal services. So I, I, to explain this concept, I give a simplified diagram of uh, a micro community with three lifeline systems, electric power, water, and transportation. Um, these lifeline systems are providing services to agriculture, industry, and business, residents, uh, emergency like firefighting, and uh, hospitals for critical customers like hospitals. You see over on the left side of the screen, we have electric power generation being served by water. That electric power that is generated is used by the water, which is an example of an interdependency. These services provided to the users, the industrial and agricultural, for example, are used to allow them to create other services that they will provide using the transportation and communication systems to other users, right? So in this case, I'm showing industry going to business. So the businesses provide services for others, which could be directly to the residential customers or other intermediaries. But eventually this all flows down most commonly to some kind of a, a residential user or customer. So this is the idea of services for services. We need to recognize that not all lifeline infrastructure systems are used for a single purpose. Each may also provide different levels and types of service. For example, a, a single water system can be used to provide water for irrigation, sanitation, firefighting, human consumption, and other purposes. Transportation systems are used for mobility and connectivity, emergency transport, low-tech moving of information, and other purposes. So recognizing the multiple service categories lifeline systems provide is critical for addressing their importance for supporting community resilience. We'll get back to this in a little bit, but now I want to um, give you a, a brief history of lifeline earthquake engineering. So this year, the year 2021, is the 50 year anniversary of lifeline earthquake engineering. It essentially started on February 9th, 1971, when a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake struck the Northern San Fernando Valley. This is the San Fernando earthquake. And it hit Los Angeles and nearby cities causing lots of damage to schools, hospitals, homes, and other buildings, as well as all of the lifeline systems. So here's some images of devastating damage to hospitals and housing. Here's some fault rupture damage to highways and arterial roadways on the right, that's Foothill Boulevard with the fault rupture coming up through it. 
that damage the uh, water retaining dams. These are the upper and lower San Fernando dams, water pipelines and tanks, electric power uh, equipment, natural gas and local fuels pipelines, communication systems, stormwater conveyance systems, and a wide variety of transportation systems. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute and American Society of Civil Engineers Technical Council on Lifeline Earthquake Engineering, which is now part of the ACE Infrastructure Resilience Division, pioneered the development of Lifeline Earthquake Engineering. They have for a long time and continue to provide post-earthquake investigations, develop best practices, and be associated with development of guidelines and standards. From the onset, Lifelines recognized the need for rapid return to service in order to support the community. So this, this has been an understood concept for over 50 years in Lifeline or Quick Engineering. So in many ways, we need to understand that Lifeline systems have been addressing uh, the concept of engineering resilience before we understood it by this term of resilience. Um, significant progress has been made, but not nearly enough. There, there remains to be much more to be done, which I'll, I'll get to at the end of this presentation. So I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, remind you or point out, if you didn't already know, of a conference that we will be having held in person on February 7th through 11th in 2022 at the UCLA campus. This conference is co-hosted by the UCLA Samuli School of Engineering and American Society of Civil Engineers Infrastructure Resilience Division. We initiated this conference on the 50-year anniversary kickoff on February 9th of this year, um, and we will be holding activities throughout the 2021 year. So please follow us on the uh, at the website down below and look for uh, announcements of activities. We will have a series of seminars and webinars coming up soon. So now that we understand how earthquakes can damage lifeline systems, at least in general, I show the same diagram with a fault rupture going through it to simulate something like the San Fernando earthquake. And it damages uh, the, the systems and removes their ability to provide services in this example. So without the ability to, without having mitigation activities to prevent this damage, the services are lost, which threatens the livelihood and it inhibits the providing of other societal services as I previously described. So timely restoration of lifeline services is critical for emergency response and community recovery. This defines the need for resilient infrastructure systems. The disaster resilience of a community is completely linked to the resilience of lifeline systems. So let's now step back a little bit and discuss somewhat the idea of community resilience. So here I provide three definitions of community resilience. I don't want to describe and compare or even get into why resilience uh, definitions differ. What I want to do instead is to highlight some key terms and phrases. These are in red. Uh, they include mitigating hazards containing the effects of disasters, recover activities, minimizing social disruption, survive, adapt and thrive, chronic stresses, acute shocks and transform or transformation. Uh, prepare for and adapt to changing conditions, withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. So all of these are key phrases for which we understand resilience and uh, they embody uh, what we need to do. But when you take these definitions, which are kind of high level, it's really difficult for lifeline system organizations to understand how to take these key terms and these concepts and implement them into creating a more resilient system than what they already have. Um, they, they, they get all of these phrases, you know, that's it, not difficult to understand the phrases, but implementing resilience is difficult, especially from these high level uh, definitions, which probably are better used to mobilize um, policy than to directly implement them in an operating system. So because of this, I have a working definition that a resilient lifeline infrastructure system is managed to provide safe and reliable services to customers and users, cope with chronic stressors and accommodate hazard related impacts with the ability to continue providing services or limit service outage times tolerable for community recovery efforts. So there's a lot in here. First, you need to recognize that this, this definition emphasizes services. It also requires another definition, the definition of what is tolerable at a timeline without having services is tolerable to community recovery efforts. 
It also recognizes that we're not trying to create a resistance system, but a resilient system. A resistance system would not have damage, right? But we, we, we have to understand that in these large complicated systems that I already described, it's probably impossible to keep damage and loss of services uh, for a large extreme event, like a, a major earthquake. So that's embodied in this definition. There's other things, um, but I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but those are the key points. We also need to understand that resilience is a system level concept. So for lifeline systems, we need to first define how the system can provide services to customers and users. Then we need to define how each component must perform to ensure the system can meet its objectives. So following a major hazard strike, we need to emphasize first how to get the services to customers, then how to complete all of the repairs. So a resilient system can restore services to customers and users when needed, even in a damaged state, right? So to do that, we need to prioritize mitigations and repairs needed to restore the services. To accomplish this, we need two measures. First, the loss and recovery of system functionality, which is an expression of system damage. And second, the loss and recovery of system operability, which is an, which is an expression of system service provision. These distinguish between the ability to utilize the physical infrastructure components making up the system and the operational level at which services are capable of being provided in the system. So here I provide a slide to illustrate uh, the conceptual representation of system functionality and operability. So this curve on the vertical axis, I'm showing functionality and operability in percent. And on the horizontal axis, uh, it, it shows it presents time. Before an event, you would expect that for the most part, all lifeline systems are able to provide nearly 100% of their services to their customers, right? So we don't really expect a large, on any given day, on a normal day, we don't expect water systems or power systems to have a huge outage. We expect them to have 100% or nearly 100% of their customers with services. Uh, there may be some components out of service for maintenance, but for the most part, uh, functionality would also be at or around 100%. But then as we go through time, eventually we'll have a, an extreme earthquake, which will damage the system as already explained, and then you will have a loss of functionality. Uh, you start making the repairs and restoring functionality till eventually it gets back to the way it was before the earthquake or near to what it was. So on the right side of this curve, you see R2, which is recovery level two, which is what it would be before the earthquake. Or maybe it's not repaired to exactly the way it was, but it can still function sufficiently. And, and we ended up at R3. Or beyond that time, we may continue making improvements and uh, you could end up with R1, which is better than what it was before the earthquake. Well, we also see an operability curve here in orange. And we notice that operability ne doesn't necessarily have to follow the functionality curve. So if there's redundancies and uh, isolation capabilities and so on and so forth, these resilience traits that we're uh, mostly familiar with, you, you, the system should be able to continue providing services and not lose as many services as there are uh, loss in function. And, with a few repairs, hopefully you can get all of the services back in order. So in this particular example, which is not typical, I just chose 60% functionality reaches 100% operability. So what we need to understand is that full functionality is restored when all repairs are completed, right? So that's shown on the upper right of the diagram. Full operability is restored when all basic services are provided. That's shown in the middle, full operability up the top of the 100% line. And we need both measures to support the infrastructure resilience definition I provided earlier. So recall that lifeline system types have different purposes and levels uh, of service. I mentioned that earlier before I talked about the 50 year anniversary of the San Fernando earthquake. So we need to classify the basic service categories for infrastructure, um, the infrastructure system must provide in a disaster. So examples of this you could put in your mind is uh, emergency communication or emergency transportation. The basic services are those adequate to allow customers and users to proceed with or resume activities in a relatively normal manner in relation to those amenities. So the basic services are a subset of all services and levels of service that a lifeline system might have. 
And community resilience improves with the restoration of each basic service to each user. That's, that's the continuous function I showed in the earlier diagram. So the accomplishment of basic services through the network defines system operability. The system is considered to have 100% operability when all of the basic services are provided throughout the infrastructure system service areas. So here's an example listing of water system basic service categories. On the left column, you see uh, water delivery, quality, quantity, and fire protection listed as basic service categories. There are technical descriptions, uh, which I won't read for sake of time uh, here in the, on the right column. But what we do need to understand is respectively, these basic service categories help you understand if you have water, is it safe to drink? Is there enough water? And is it adequate to fight fires? So using the same diagram earlier, but blowing up on the time scale, right? Shortening it up so that we can see it a little bit better. Uh, I give you a representation of the system basic service categories with respect to operability to help you better understand what this means. So I show basic service categories as BSC acronym one, two, three, and four. Assume that those are the same four basic service categories I just identified for the water system, right? So delivery, quantity, quality, and fire protection. So once all of these are achieved, then we have reached full operability. So what you see here is that orange operability curve basically bounds the basic service category curves. So the basic service categories, functionality and operability are continuous measures over time. Full operability and full basic service category restorations are states at given times as well as full functionality. Here I show the reality of what these mean. These are actual measurements of those basic service categories in response to the 1994 Northridge earthquake for the Los Angeles water system. I plot with real data and real measurements of water delivery, quantity, quality, and fire protection. Uh, and you see the operability curve in black, roughly bounding. In this case, it's uh, controlled by quality, but that is not always the case for any water system in any given earthquake. And I also plot functionality. So we see here in this case that full operability was stored to 750,000 people in Northern Los Angeles after the 1994 Northridge earthquake in 12 days. But yet functionality you see is a much lower curve uh, at this point at 12 days. And it actually took six years to reach full functionality. So it, it, and this, is, this is real data showing how long it might take to to restore the functionality of a, of a very large and complicated system, but yet we don't have to wait six years to get full uh, operability. This table here shows how this idea can be expanded to all lifeline systems. So on the left column, I'm showing all of the lifeline systems previously described. And on the top row, I'm showing the different basic service categories for each. Each, each lifeline system has an X in the box associated with the basic service categories of which they would be associated with. For example, water has delivery, quantity, quality, and fire protection as previously explained. I'm not gonna spend time to go through this table in great detail. I just want you to understand how this can be generalized to all lifeline systems. Further, this table shows for each of those basic service categories shown on the top row of the prior table that they can have a, a definition. Right, so I give a summary description, which I'm not gonna go through in detail, but you're welcome to review this presentation later and take a closer look or look at some of the papers of which I'll give you some references later at the end. So now I wanna move forward into the concept of functional recovery. So NIST and FEMA have recently completed a report, which is uh, available at this uh, website shown on the screen, um, where they addressed at the request of Congress the concept of reoccupancy and functional recovery time. Reoccupancy is related to buildings and not directly associated with all aspects of a lifeline system, but it certainly has an association with the buildings as components within a lifeline system. We're gonna focus on the functional recovery time uh, and its uh, definition relative to lifeline systems. So functional recovery is defined in this report as a post earthquake performance state, my emphasis added, in which a lifeline infrastructure system is maintained or restored to safely and adequately support the basic intended functions associated with the pre-earthquake service level of a lifeline infrastructure system. 
So here I show the diagram off to the side, same, di same diagram that I've shown before, and just rehashing some of these descriptions. So functional recovery is a state before achieving restoration of full functionality, right? So it's not full functionality, but it, it could be if you have a very linear system. Remember the full functionality is a state achieved when all repairs are completed. And operability is a continuous function measuring the restoration of all basic services. When you think about how all of these concepts fit together, essentially what comes up is that functional recovery is pretty close, if not the same as the idea of full operability. So functionality is essentially the same state as when you achieve full operability. We also need to point out that functional, functional recovery is implemented using an objective to achieve the functional recovery state at an acceptable time following a specified earthquake intensity measure. Okay, so including recovery objectives for lifelines means designing beyond safety. So we're not just dealing with risk and safety, we're dealing with recovery times of services. And addressing this for lifelines requires us to look at the geospatial hazard exposure, assessing ability to meet target service recovery objectives, their interdependencies, how they operate in silos or should not operate in silos, the lack of system level design for services in extreme events, uh, system deterioration or component deterioration, the range of regulatory requirements imposed on lifeline systems, and the limited or lack of and inconsistencies in uh, design manuals, guidelines, standards, and specialized systems and components. For the recovery objectives, we need to think about at minimum two primary goals. Goal one is to identify what is needed and when. So we need to define target maximum losses and recovery times for restoring basic service categories for different user groups consistently across all lifeline infrastructure systems as a function of the rarity of hazard intensities. Okay, that's, that's a lot to do just in that statement. And then we have goal two, identify how to get what is needed and when. So from goal one, we can define within each system the basic intended functions needed to achieve the service restoration goals. This requires multidisciplinary input and the knowledge of social function needs, which most engineers don't have, right? So we need to go well beyond engineering to achieve this. We also need to incorporate the supply and demand side management because there are many adaptations the systems and the customers can concurrently undertake, such as utilizing emergency alternative services like bottled water, generators, et cetera. So in this context, lifeline system resilience is not independent of community resilience. These are intimately linked together and cannot proceed independently. Society can greatly benefit from the restoring some lifeline basic services while awaiting others to be restored. For example, delivering some water, even if it doesn't meet potable water standards, helps the public health, sanitation, and firefighting, and many other aspects. Sewage collection, for example, even if it's not properly treated or disposed, significantly improves public health. Uh, emergency communications and emergency transport lines aid emergency response, even if the full communication and transportation system is not usable. So as a result, some societal functions can be functionally recovered with only a portion of the lifeline basic services provided by the networks. Lifeline systems need to coordinate within the communities that they serve and be transparent about potential losses of services to whom and for how long for all of this to happen. The systems also need to coordinate with other lifelines to account for dependencies and interdependence. So with all of that as background, I now want to move into some experiences on operationalizing them into resilient practice. So I'm gonna give you some examples from uh, my work at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. I'm gonna go over performance-based design, seismic resilient pipe network, seismic resilient uh, water supply task force, fire following earthquake, and developing a seismic resilience program. So let's start with performance-based seismic design. So the background for this is uh, in a report uh, given to the LA water system or prepared for the LA water system. Uh, the cover shown here on the right, uh, which established system level, 
and component level design criteria for multiple possible earthquakes. The defined system level criteria in terms of service losses and recovery targets. It defines component level targets to meet the system level criteria. But we have to start with understanding performance categories. So here I identify three really important performance categories. They are services, life safety, and property protection. I, I think we're all pretty much familiar with life safety and property protection. Uh, these are performance criteria longstanding in the design of lifeline systems. What we haven't always done is include services as a performance category, although the ultimate goal is to provide services to customers, well recognized. But in an extreme event, we haven't actually consistently utilized services as a performance category or a performance goal. So we need to include the services. Then from that, we can identify uh, performance criteria relating to these services. Here I show a table for performance-based design giving four levels of criteria, levels one, two, three, and four, uh, each associated with a hazard return period of respectively 100, 500, 2,500, and something beyond 2,500 years, maybe up to in the order of 10,000 or even more years. I'll explain that a little bit more in a few minutes. So for each of these, we have uh, defined performance criteria in terms of the basic service categories. So for 100 years uh, return periods, we don't want a lot of damage. We don't want a lot of effects and impacts to the customer. So very limited outage and rapid re restoration. So everybody in this case should be restored within three days. For a 500 year event in Los Angeles, we consider that to be something under order of what happened in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. So we want everybody operable, uh, having their services operable within about 20 days, uh, except for water quantity, which in some earthquakes we may have to ration possibly up to 30 days. For level three events, uh, we're looking at customer services being operable within 30 days, except for in some events, we might have to ration up to 60 days and if for level four, which is intended to constrain really large rare events, right? To keep the cascading events from getting out of control. That's its primary purpose um, because we can manage those in a resilience context. And for those, we want everybody to have restored services within about 45 days, except for in some cases with quantity, we might need to ration possibly up to 12 months. Now this, this table incorporates a wide range of types of earthquakes. The, some great earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault, for example, that can occur within every 150 to 500 years. And uh, smaller events, for example, maybe a magnitude 6.6 .6 or 6.7 on the Hollywood Fault, which might occur on the order of every 8,000 years, right? So therefore we get the cascading control events, controlling the cascading uh, uh, events within a 10,000 year time frame, right? So all of this is incorporated and there are steps on how to manage that that I won't be able to go through in this particular presentation. So from that, we move forward and address uh, recovery times for the basic service categories of which I've already described. So I won't go through them again. And for community resilience, we identify two primary types of customers. They are critical A customers, which are those directly related to public health and safety. For example, those would be hospitals, evacuation centers, fire department, and so on. And critical B customers, which are those critical to community resilience, especially in the short, shorter timeframes or the early timeframes of response and recovery. Uh, or in recovery, I mean response is basically the critical A customers. So the recovery aspects, which include uh, schools that are not used as evacuation centers, lifeline utilities, not providing public health services, and so on. There is a wide number of these types of customers that you could imagine. So here I show a plotting of level two event, water system service recovery goals. So you see delivery, quantity, quality, and fire protection here. The brown is delivery in red fire, blue quantity, and green is quality. You see quality we break in, we actually have a trifurcation point where we could lose all of our quality, but that's only by definition that it doesn't meet public health standards. Uh, we don't know if it does, most of them probably still would, but that's just what's going to happen in a real event. And we want our critical A customers to have 90% in a level two event 
restored to service within three days. And within a couple of weeks, we want 100% of those services uh, restored to all critical A customers. For critical B customers, we're looking at 90% within about a week, then two weeks for everybody, and then everybody else recovered within two weeks as previously described. Here I show a similar diagram, but for one basic service category, this is delivery for each of the different hazard levels. So you see that as the hazard levels increase from one to four, uh, there's an allowance for more service losses immediately after the earthquake and a longer time frame to restore those services. So you would have similar diagrams for each of the basic service categories. I'm not gonna show all of those. Now dealing with other system level uh, design criteria. So then we also move forward now into component level design criteria, which we identify using criticality categories. So these are the components needed to get the services back to the customers, right? If they're damaged. So we have criticality categories one, two, three, and four. Those should have some resemblance to uh, your understanding of risk categories for buildings in the building code. For each of these criticality categories, which must be defined to each component or said reversely, each component in the system must be defined, have a defined criticality category relative to its importance uh, within the system to meeting these services. And they would be defined a return period for design. So for, criti for example, criticality category four has a design level, uh, design hazard return period of 24, 75 years. And those relate to the critical A customers. Critical B customers, 975. Uh, most all of the rest are uh, level two, criticality category two for 475. And those that really don't have a lot of uh, necessity for getting critical services restored uh, or getting operability back, they would be uh, criticality category one. So these uh, are identified in this table for how to uh, establish the objectives for performance of each of those. For example, for a component uh, at a 475 year return period, if it's a criticality category one, the damage associated with that from that type of event could be very severe, right? But that's okay because it's not that important, right? So that might be cost effective to an owner of a lifeline system. But for criticality category four, we would expect very minor damage at a 475 year return period. Then we move up uh, all the way to level four event scenarios. We will only look at criticality categories three and four. Then what we do for those is they are evaluated uh, in two ways for criticality categories three and four. One normally uh, like you're, you're used to doing, but then you would also take a look at a level four uh, scenario and see how the system is performing and then present that to the managers uh, uh, in charge to determine if it's worth and cost effective to upgrade to deal with the level four or if it's better to not do that at that time. So now I want to move into um, describing a seismic resilient pipe network. So this is one tactic used to achieve the target recovery goals. Uh, a resilient network is designed and constructed to accommodate hazard related impacts with the ability to continue provided services or limit service outage times tolerable to community recovery efforts. Uh, this definition covers all 7,000 miles of pipe in the LA water system, not just those seismically robust pipes and how they all interact to meet performance objectives. Uh, it transforms the existing water pipe network into an adaptable network that can restore water services meeting the performance criteria. And it recognizes that damage cannot be prevented in large events. So here I'm going to present to you a uh, short video developed by the LA water and power uh, that describes this better than I can. At LADWP, we're committed to delivering clean and reliable water to our customers. But what does reliable mean? It doesn't just mean delivering water when it's a nice 72 degree and sunny day. It also means delivering water when conditions aren't ideal, like after an earthquake. In a city as big as Los Angeles, that's no easy task. An earthquake can break some water pipes, therefore interrupting water service. That's why we're working to build a seismic resilient pipe network made up of earthquake resistant pipes. Unlike our traditional distribution pipes whose joints could possibly separate as the earth jolts around them, 
Earthquake-resistant ductile iron pipes are fitted using longer joints that allow the pipe to move without separating. And if the earth moves a lot, the pipe will lock into place and then pull on the next pipe and the next pipe, like a giant chain allowing the pipeline to stretch and continue to be in service. In order to make our system seismically resilient, our plan for the future is to use these pipes to create a grid across the city, a seismic backbone. This will not only help provide even more reliable water for firefighting, this network will allow us to run lines to critical emergency services like hospitals, firefighters, and other first responders, so that even if other pipes break within the grid, we'll still be able to get water to the places that need it to serve the community during a natural disaster. These efforts are tied to the city's resiliency plans for lifeline systems and are being designed and executed in the most cost-effective way possible. The whole backbone will not be put in place at once. Rather, we'll map out the grid and install an earthquake-resilient pipe when the original pipe has reached the end of its usable life and needs to be replaced. This will allow us to create a resilient system over decades while still keeping costs down ensuring that when a big one occurs, we'll have our services available to help those that need help right away, and also that we'll be able to get our city back on its feet and back to normal as soon as possible. To learn more, visit www.ladwp.com. So I hope that gives you an idea of um, what a seismic resilient pipe network is intended to do. Here I show some additional pipelines that could be used to formulate a resilient network. It's not just limited to earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe, which is the preferred network pipe for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. The next topic I wanna to move on to is a seismic resilience water supply task force. This is a task force created to deal with importing water supply to Southern California. It includes uh, three primary agencies, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, and the California Department of Water and Resources. This task force uh, is important because they bring in the majority of water supply for use in Southern California. And these supply sources, which are made up from the California Aqueduct, the Los Angeles Aqueducts and the Colorado River Aqueduct owned and operated by each of these agencies all cross, as you see on the map on the right, the San Andreas Fault. And so on any given major event on the San Andreas Fault, uh, one, two, or even all three of these uh, supply sources could be damaged and disrupted for relatively long periods of time. So these agencies have agreed to work together to treat these systems as not three individual systems, but one regional system of three primary lines. And so the, it is an active program. Um, it, they have short, intermediate, and long-term plans. Identify the short-term plans or the near-term plans here to coordinate emergency response, seismic assessments of the aqueducts, assess the power of vulnerabilities, uh, conduct joint emergency exercises and investigating aquatic intertides for emergency use. Then moving on to the fire following earthquake program, uh, we worked with the LA Fire Department to identify the fire hazard areas, alternative water supply sources, and distances that the LA Fire Department can relay their water with their equipment, independent of uh, a completely usable water network. So this incorporates the idea of a seismic resilient grid as mentioned earlier in the video. Uh, and also, we also looked at the use of recycled water um, for helping fight fires, uh, especially if, with the incorporation of earthquake resistant pipes. And we've undertaken a citywide fire following earthquake risk assessment. Uh, SPA risk undertook that assessment, which is summarized on these uh, three diagrams. So on the right, what we're showing is one of several earthquakes that were looked at. This one's for the, happens to be the Punta Hills magnitude seven earthquake scenario, where we look at the intensities of shaking across the city and the effects on the pipes. Uh, and, well, the earthquake, the system as a whole, not just the pipes. But um, then we identify the potential ignitions uh, from that earthquake and the total water demands needed to extinguish these types of fires from those ignitions. Then we need to move on to assess how to meet those demands by using alternate water supplies where you can't get it through the network and also how the network can be improved using the seismic resilient pipe network to be able to provide the fire flows after an earthquake to help uh, extinguish these ignitions. And then lastly, I want to move into a topic for developing a resilience program. This actually was the first step that we undertook 
for developing a water system resilience program in the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. But I bring it forward to you last because it's had further development outside of the LA Department of Water and Power. Uh, so what we need to do, what we did was first identify uh, the characteristics of a resilient water system. Then identify which uh, of those characteristics are currently possessed from which you can identify the gaps. Uh, that's shown in this diagram at the bottom of this slide. But with those gaps, you can move into uh, developing a, a, uh, several plans and even sub programs like I've already mentioned, uh, which becomes part of a continuous cycle, right? So you identify your gaps, you put them into your capital program, you uh, implement them. And in that process, you learn more about resilience and what you might need to be doing. And as you complete some of those steps um, and, and those projects and programs, then you might, uh, you should be taking on the next set of priorities and continually move those around. Or you might enhance your capabilities of just adding more uh, in this cycle. And resilience is essentially a continuous process. There's, it's, all, it's ever evolving if you understand the concepts well. And so this is a process of which uh, should be continued within uh, organizations on a perpetual basis. This, as I mentioned, has been expanded. So the ideas developed originally in the LA water system have been further enhanced with a group of people. And we defined 17 total characteristics. Actually, there's 18 now. We found one after the publication that I show on the right, which is published in the Natural Hazards Review. I refer you to that paper because I don't have time to go through this in great detail. But we have 17, actually now 18 characteristics defined and 119 achievement indicators. Uh, also for further reference, there's an ASC webinar you could find at this link, as well as I included in an, an AAC, or ERI webinar that's at the second link in the middle of the screen. And I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, uh, Ali Mustafavi and Haizong Wong. But a little bit more about this, I identify the 17 characteristics in these next slides there. We have eight of those identified in technical, uh, under the technical domain. I'm not gonna go through these in detail. I, that's why I refer you to other uh, references. But we also have six organizational characteristics and four social economic characteristics. The SE4 down at the bottom is the one that we've recently added. Uh, also the 119 achievement indicators are each associated with, with different characteristics. And for them, you can, uh, they're tabulated so that you could review them and identify which ones that you may have, which are uh, hypothetically listed here with a check and which that you don't, which are the cross, the, the horizontal line. And you could use those to define your gaps and go through the process I prior described. So now I wanna move into further steps that we need to take for operationalizing infrastructure resilience. I'm just gonna summarize some of the more important concepts that we need to move forward now, which are creating consistent codes and standards. We need to develop lifeline councils across the country. Uh, we need to deal with the interdependencies. Um, uh, we need consistent service restoration goals. Uh, we need to improve seismic systems analysis methods to make them easier to implement into practice for these complicated systems. And we need to improve decision support systems. These and many other aspects are listed in these three NIST and FEMA references that I show at the bottom of the screen. And so with that, that's primarily the end of my lecture, but I do wanna carry forward, as Katerina mentioned earlier, the uh, distinguished lecture is intended to reach out uh, not only through the annual meeting, which is what I'm doing here, but also to local chapters and have more intimate conversations. Uh, this year, as well as last, with David Bonowitz being last year's distinguished lecture, are disrupted by COVID-19. So at present, we're not sure that we're going to be able to travel to different local chapters to give this lecture. So instead, what we've done is this is recorded so that it can be viewed online by others, which also disrupts the need to actually go to different places just to see the lecture because it's freely available online. So what we're trying to do is to create interaction online upon request with local chapters. For that, we need some innovative ideas. Uh, some of those might be to just have open discussions, questions and answers, uh, join local panels, uh, et cetera. So we encourage new and local ideas and make proposals from the local chapters. 
And I can provide, I'm offering to provide additional lectures covering greater details of some of the subtopics that I just overviewed uh, in this particular lecture. Then EE or I may want to pre-record some of these lectures in advance and make them available online. Right now, I'll plan to offer to give maybe three to five lectures in 2021 upon request. We can be quite flexible on that and how that's done and how many are given. So please feel free to contact me at my email or directly through the ERI office. And so I wanna close with that and just leave you with this list of references and credits that you might wanna to refer to for more information related to the lecture that I just provided. So thank you again. I am truly honored to receive this award and have the ability to give you this lecture. And I look forward to speaking with all of you in the near future and hopefully in person. Thank you, Craig for this amazing and interesting lecture and congratulations again on your 2021 ERI Distinguished Lecture Award. Thank you all so much for attending. We hope to see you again for next week's webinar and for others in the series this fall. If you have a moment, we'd appreciate if you could please complete the post-webinar survey to provide your feedback. You can also learn more about ERI at eeri.org. And if you're not already a member, please see the follow-up email for more information on how to join us. You can also find out about future webinars on our website and in the ERI Pulse newsletter. Finally, we would like to thank FEMA for supporting this webinar. Thank you and see you next time. <laughs>